sing it from our heart just to Jesus. I really believe that when you praise God, just things light up for you in your life. You just see breakthrough. You see beautiful things just start to flow out of you. And so we just want to sing this one more time. We give you the highest praise because you deserve it all. Just let it come off your lips and say, I love your presence. Holy Spirit, I love your presence. Jesus, I love your presence. Thank you. Thank you.
couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. And oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, yeah. There's no end to it. to sing this next part it's so simple but it just speaks of just how just he won't stop until he can get his loving arms around you and just carry you through let's just declare just the love of our good God it goes your love is relentless your love is relentless Love is relentless, God. Sing. Love is relentless. Your love is relentless. Just sing. Yes, it is. Your love is relentless. I don't 
Scriptures teach us not to love in words, but in actions. And the overwhelming, relentless love of God is more than just a refrain we sing. God wants to, to show His love to each of you. He wants to pour His love into you. He wants His love to become something real and something strong and something that you can count on and something that does something in your life. Let me just put it that way. And Sunday morning, you know, as we were worshiping in both the, the 9 and 11 service, we, we had just an unusual anointing for healing. And I'd shared how I had had a condition called Barrett's syndrome, and it's a, it's a very low, low, low probability of being becoming esophageal cancer. But it's, a very, it's just something they watch. And a year ago, I'd been diagnosed with this, and I said, you know, God, I don't want that. And I'd gone in for my test, and the test had come back completely negative, that there's no Barrett's syndrome, which is really good. Praise God. And I shared that, and we it opened up the altars to, for people to pray, and there was just this anointing of healing. We had a, a woman uh, healed of her eyes. We had a young boy, about seven years old, who was healed of an eye condition. We had somebody healed in their hip. We had somebody else healed in their neck. We had a number of different just, you know, tangible physical expressions of God's love, and, and, and that expression was the power to heal the sick. And so... You know, before we go any further in this service, and I'm very excited for my friend Pastor JR to share what he has to share. It's a, it's a wonderful word. But if you have sickness in any body in your body, and I'm Ted, I know you just had knee surgery, and I want some people together around him. But if you say that's me, I've got something that just the doctors can't fix it, or, or it's just bothering me tonight, or whatever it is, pain to cancer. Slip your hand up right now. Just slip your hand up and say, that's me. And we've got some folks over here, and I'd like somebody to pray for Ted. Anybody else here around? And please, if two or three people could just go and begin to lay hands. And uh, Reuben, if you could, that's Ted, by the way. If you could just raise hands on him, please. And just begin to speak the promise of God, which is that believers will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. I want to encourage you with this verse from Jesus' instructions to his disciples. And he said he called his 12 disciples together and he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom and to heal the sick. We are more than just telling people about the kingdom. We're demonstrating it. And Father, right now in Jesus' name, we who are left, begin to just pray with me. We begin to speak the kingdom of God into existence on these situations. We speak for Ted's knee. We speak for others and their issues. God, in Jesus' name, we proclaim healing is not something that we hope for. It's something we walk in, God. And so we speak healing over these individuals. We say that we are indeed believers. We are indeed followers, disciples of Christ. And so, God, we walk in His authority now, and we proclaim the kingdom of God over these circumstances. And we say, be healed right now in Jesus' name. I lift up Elena, God, and we prayed for her earlier. We just speak healing to her back. We speak healing to her body. No more pain in her, Father God. We speak healing to everyone else in this room. And we declare it to be done in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I'm just looking around. And I'm just, I'm asking if you, I want you to test yourself if you had pain or anything that you know was different. Uh, and you see a change. Maybe if it was a, an eight or a nine, maybe it's dropped to a four or a five. Uh, just if you can see a difference, just wave at me. I'm, I'm covering my eyes so I can see that there's a difference. Anything in this room, I'm just looking. Because I believe that what we saw Sunday was not meant to be just an event for Sunday morning. It's something that's meant to be normative in our services that we see God healing people. 
and that's great. Anybody notice a difference? I'm just looking around. Aaron, maybe you can, my eyes are a little blinded. We're good. You see anything? Well, I want you to continue to stand in faith. And it was interesting. A woman came up to me after service, after the nine o'clock service. She said, Pastor, I'm embarrassed to raise my hand. I didn't want you to call on me. But I was the one, my hip was totally in pain. And when I, when you guys laid hands on my shoulders, the pain went away. And so I respect you if you're a little embarrassed. But please tell me afterwards so I can share it on Sunday morning. If you're watching us online and if God touched you, please email us at ecdenver.org. And we love all of you guys. Thank you so much. Be in faith. Right now, I'm going to ask you again to stand up. If you would, and just go around the room and greet some people. Uh, say hello to some people. This is JR and Yvonne on the front row. Be nice to them, and they'll be nice to you. Anyway. <laughs> Good to have each and every one of you. Uh, my name is Pastor Reese. If you're a guest tonight and you're visiting us, we sure are so happy to have you, and we encourage you to come back again. Our services are Sundays at 9 and 11, and we have a service every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. And uh, we call ourselves Encounter Church because, you know, we're a diverse community of people seeking God together, seeking to have an encounter with God together. And we're diverse. We don't look the same. We don't, you know smell the same. I guess some of us smell. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but we also share Jesus and love to our city and the world, and we're so happy to have you here. You know, right now, I want to encourage you to go ahead and prepare your tithes and your missionary supports and your offerings for tonight. I also want to encourage you, uh, if you know, all of you who feel led, and even if you don't feel led, to go ahead and include an extra offering for JR. Just put, just put JR and put an amount on it, on your offering envelope or on your... Uh, on your uh, text to give, you can see that the information is just, you know, put speaker on that if you're following that or go to the website. It's good for a church to be generous. Don't you agree? Well, I got the front row amening. It's good for a church to be generous. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, the way a church is generous is for the church's people to be generous. And so as we create a, a culture of generosity you know, amongst ourselves, we realize that God blesses us because God always blesses generosity. And so I thank you for that. And so as you've prepared your offerings, if I could ask the ushers to come forward. Father, we just thank you in Jesus' name that, that you never you know, tell us to buy our way into heaven, Father. It's a free gift. But so is giving. And Father, Paul encouraged us all to excel in the grace of giving. And that it takes faith, it takes grace, it takes a trust in you, an anointing from you, God, to be able to be generous. We live in a world that, that you know, is the exact opposite of generous. But God, we choose not to live like the world. We choose to be different. And we choose to sow and to give and to trust you, Father. To trust you, that you will not only take care of us, you will take care of us in abundant ways. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you may serve the people uh, as they are. I just want to go over a couple of upcoming announcements. Uh, say October 20th with me. You didn't say it all. It's October 20th with me. I told you to say it with me. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey, October 20th, we're doing one of the first of our follow-ups to our serve day. Uh, we went out this summer and had a number of projects serving our community. We're going to be doing some more projects this fall. On the 20th of October, uh, we need your help to clean up county line between Holly and Quebec. We had a great team of people who went out with myself and Pastor Aaron this fall or this summer. Most of those people can't go. We've actually tried to hit them up. Many of them are out of town or they're scared of me, one of the two. So if you are available on the 20th, please uh, be right here in our church lobby at 9.30 that day. We'll leave from here, carpool, we'll clean up uh, county line, and we'll probably even go to lunch afterwards. So it'll be a lot of fun. Hope you can make it. Also want to let you know that on Sunday the 21st is our last Israel information meeting. Now we've got a lot of people interested in the trip. You do need to register by October 31st. And so you don't have to pay for the whole trip, but you will probably need to be pay the $500 registration fee. So please uh, come on the 21st if you'd like information. And 
get online, find out the registration, but don't miss this incredible trip to Israel. So that's wonderful. Also want to let you know, what is special about October 31st? Harvest. harvest. It's Halloween, but in, you know we're going to be having a harvest festival. That's Wednesday night. We are actually taking our whole service, and we're going to be serving the community. It's going to be a great three hours. Uh, we've got bounce houses. Uh, we've got, uh, I, I think we're sacrificing a goat at, uh, to the pagan god. I don't know what all we're doing, but we're going to be having s'mores and a bunch of games and everything. And Dan, is that you? Praise God. God. I, man, Dan Yuki, I, I waved at you and I was pretty sure that was you. We're believing for your healing, brother, man. Believing for victory there. So good to see everybody here. But we are just going to have a great night on October 31st. It'll be even better if you come and you help us. So uh, check out the information table, sign up to be a volunteer, and bring a bag of candy. Also want to let you know next Sunday there's a parent uh, information meeting about the changes in the youth ministry at uh, 1045. And uh, that's it. So without further ado, I want to invite to the platform my friend, Pastor J. R. Paul Hemus. Hey, you can use the stairs over here. That's okay. I don't need the stairs. Well, <laughs> you've heard about people who don't use the stairs. I know, I know. Okay, I fair don't. enough. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm really happy to be here. Judah and the worship team, I really enjoyed the worship tonight. I felt right at home. Uh, you know, I've, I've pastored The Rock. I've been at The Rock in Castle Rock. for. Uh, I was the lead pastor for 28 and a half years, and then... About a year and a half ago, a little over a year and a half ago, uh, January, the end of January of 2017, my son, our son, took over, and uh, he's been the pastor there. I'm still, they still let me preach once in a while, but not very often. So I appreciate Reese and Sarah giving me an opportunity here. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I, I feel home again. I, another reason is uh, Reese and Sarah are probably two of our favorite friends. Uh, we've gotten to know them. We got to know Reese on the uh, and Sarah, Sarah was writing her book, but we got to know her a little bit on the trip to Alaska. And then we got to know them really well. Uh, in fact, every month or two we get together, whether it's for lunch or dinner. And uh, we've really gotten, I love their kids. These guys not only are great people, they're great parents and they're incredible pastors. And you guys are incredibly blessed. <laughs> I want to introduce to you my wife, uh, who is really the one who has rescued my life in more ways than one. Honey, would you stand up and wave at everybody and let them see your pretty face? All right. <laughs> and so uh, anyway, I'm really thankful to be here. Uh, Reese told me today when I walked in, I didn't know this, that it's uh, Mental Health Day. Is that right, Reese? National it's National Mental Health Day. Now, ironically, it ties into my message, uh, not because I'm not fully healthy, but uh, but the reason, oh, before I go any further, I had two words of knowledge, uh, actually before I came, and there were two things, and I don't want to forget about it, because uh, I probably will if I start preaching. So first of all, uh, somebody's having problems with their stomach, and you've even thought, gee, I hope this isn't an ulcer, and I don't know who that is, but uh, can you wave at me who you are? Because, uh, <laughs> okay, either I can't see you or, or I missed it. Okay, I guess everybody's okay. Somebody's scratching their head, but I don't think you have... That's not you. Okay. Oh, there is somebody. Okay, good. You know what? Would you just put your hand on your stomach? I'm just going to pray from here. Heavenly Father, I just release healing. And I thank you that when you give us a word of knowledge, it's to help that person to, re to have faith and to receive what you have for them. So, Father, I just, I just release healing into the stomach area. I say that any symptoms of an ulcer will go. Uh, any problems with the stomach will go. And I just release full healing in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Second thing I got was somebody's neck. You've been having trouble with your neck. And it's been kind of a pain in the neck. <laughs> That's not a, I didn't mean to make a joke out of that. But anyway, uh, you've got a pain in the neck. And I don't know what the problem is, but you've been having problems with it. But again, if you'll let me know, I'm just going to pray from, your, from here, right from the, from the thing. So... Okay, well, I'm batting 500. That's good in baseball. Anyway, uh, so I don't, see, I don't see the person with the neck, but I, I... Is there somebody here? No? Oh, yes. Okay, good. Okay, good. Well, uh, everybody's pointing at you, so you better raise your hand. Anyway, Father, I just release healing power into the neck right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you for healing that flows to that neck. And Lord, I thank you that you just come and you do an incredible chiropractic adjustment that lasts uh, I thank you, Lord, for healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. You know, it's interesting. I, uh, I wrestled in college, and uh, I injured my neck my senior year, and uh, they had to do a, they did surgery where they did a laminectomy where they cut out part of the disc, and 
you know, I had a lot of problems with the neck. And I was in a worship service. Uh, it was in Greeley, Colorado. Actually, Andrew Womack had not even gotten up to preach, but he was preaching. He was going to be preaching that night. And uh, anyway, the, during praise and worship, the Lord just came down and just healed my neck supernaturally. Without anybody laying hands on me, he laid his hands on me. And uh, so I, I really am thankful for that. So, okay, I'm going to jump right in. And uh, my, my, the title of my message is Do Not Be Anxious. And, uh, you know, uh, Reese mentioned to me that you guys are uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, uh, if you could pick something from Matthew 6, please do. So I just, what I did was I read it over several times, just saying, Lord, have something jump out. And the scripture that jumped out at me uh, was actually Matthew chapter 6. And uh, let me see if I can get my, I should have had my iPad up here before I, uh, Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to go right there now. I'm going to read from the ESV, and, uh, and I, I'm kind of going a little different than my notes here, so uh, you'll find it there. I think it's the, I don't know. No, it's, actually, it's not, on, it's not on the screen. So just follow. If you have your Bibles, uh, just go ahead and turn to Matthew 6, and we'll jump right in. Um, and, and, and pick it up in verse 25. Matthew 6, verse 25, and... Uh, uh-oh, the only thing that comes up is the ASV. Am I not on the internet, I bet? Okay. I'll tell you what, Sarah, I'm going to have you, uh, if you don't mind, if you could go ahead into my settings and put... ESV. Sorry, yeah, I know I tried to pull up ESV, but it came up. The only thing that came up, because I don't think I'm on the internet. Uh, so anyway, while Sarah's finding that, uh, I want to just say that I saw an article recently that called us the United States of Anxiety. Not the United States of America, the United States of Anxiety. And the reason for that is uh, there's been a lot of data that's come out just recently. In May 8, 2018, um, they did a survey of people and they said, Is your anxiety, has it increased over the past year? 39% said they had an increase of anxiety. Only a very slim number said that they had, a, actually about 2% said they had a decrease, and there were several that said no, nothing. But that's a huge increase. In fact, it, it more than doubled the year before. So for some reason, uh, people are struggling with anxiety. Uh, you know, just <laughs> all, the, all the drugs that are anxiety drugs uh, have increased significantly. I mean, there's a whole lot of things. There was a survey also recently done that said 40 million people in America struggle with some form of anxiety. Now, this is not, this, this actually means where it's beyond just normal anxiety. I mean, I don't know about you, but every time I went into an exam, I had huge anxiety. And uh, I remember in college, uh, I, I remember I had studied for a British history test with another guy. We had memorized a whole lot of stuff. And when I got to the exam, <laughs> none of the questions that I had memorized, I had everything in my mind, none of those were on the list. So uh, on my way to the infirmary, I had an asthma attack and never had to take the test. Anyway, uh, <laughs> but I still have recurrent dreams of <laughs> where uh, I'm, I've, I've signed up for a class but I haven't gone to any of the classes, but the exam's coming up. I don't know if any of you have that. And that, that, you wake up with anxiety when that happens. So, uh, but I never really, you know, I, I mean, except for exams, I didn't really study with anxiety. I didn't, didn't struggle with it. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, here we go. You ready? Yes, Say Matthew 6, Matthew 6, starting with verse 25. Here we go. Therefore, this is Jesus now speaking. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to a span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin, yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What should we eat? What should we drink? Or what should we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them all. Now, I just want to stop there, and I just want to say that, you know, I think in our day and age, 
we don't worry that much about food and that much, of, you know, about clothing. And uh, I know some people do, but, but I mean in general. But there's a whole lot of other things we worry about. There's things that come and cause us to worry and creates anxiety. And anxiety is, is a difficult thing to deal with. It's, it's you know, I, I think healing, physical healing is awesome. But to be very honest with you, I think oftentimes it's more difficult to receive emotional healing than it is physical healing. It's more, it's, it's, sometimes it's harder to get over those things. And, uh, you know, the word for anxiety is a very interesting word in the Greek. It's the word, uh, the, the, the verb is merimnao. Uh, it's merimna is the noun, but merimnao. And it means, the, the literal meaning is to be pulled in different directions. And I think when someone's in anxiety, when you have anxiety, it feels like a pulling and a tearing and a ripping and pulling you in different directions. It's hard to focus. It's hard to have joy. It's hard to have peace. It's hard to have any of those things. And, and let me just say, when I talk about anxiety, uh, kind of the twin brother that walks with anxiety is depression. And usually if there's anxiety, there's depression, uh, or if there's depression, there's anxiety. The two kind of feed each other, and, and yet oftentimes the anxiety is the primary, the primary one. And uh, so the question is, what do we do? What do we do when we struggle with anxiety? And, and you know, today's, I mean, we've had weather very unusual in the last few days. I mean, it's been gloomy. It's been dark and difficult and cold, and, and uh, that will cause anxiety. Also, if you have money in the stock market, you probably had a little anxiety today because the stock market took a huge hit. And uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of things that cause that, but it's these things we worry about in life. And, uh, and so, I guess the question is, what do we do? Well, Jesus had, he had an answer to it. And if we follow through on Matthew 6 and go to the next two verses, 33 and 34, Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So what Jesus was saying is we need to be able to focus on God, which that's pretty obvious, and we need to focus on his kingdom, not our kingdom, not the kingdoms of this world, but on his kingdom, which is an eternal kingdom, which has so much more power than the material things of this world. And not only that, he goes on to say, um, he goes on to say, don't, don't be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Do you know, and I don't know how these people come up with these surveys, but there was a survey done about three years ago, and it, in the survey they found that between 85 and 90 percent of the things that people worry about for the future never come to pass. Now that's a lot of wasted energy, isn't it, when you think about it? I mean, if, if 85 to 90 percent of the things that people worry about never happen, then what a waste of energy worrying about those things. Let it rob your peace and your joy and everything else. So, that's the first thing, and, that, and, and that's a pretty obvious one. You know, when you look in the Bible, there were a lot of people that had anxiety. Uh, I mean, look at Job. Job says in, in chapter 3, he said, actually, the, the things that I have feared or been really worried about, those things have come to pass. And so he was worried about a lot of things. He was always making sacrifices. He was worried about his kids. He was worried about his family. He was always, he, he experienced a lot of anxiety. And uh, other people, Moses, Moses had tremendous anxiety when God told him he was going to lead the children of Israel out of it and go, that he was to go to Pharaoh. He said, I can't even talk. I, I, I stutter, stutter, stutter. I can't. But you know what? God provided Aaron to go with him. But he was still insecure and he was still in anxiety. What about Martha? <laughs> Martha was always worried that everything, you know, she was a clean freak. And not only that, everything had to be just right. And she was running around. And Jesus says, hey, Mary's chosen the best things. Martha... You need to cool your jets a little bit and, and get refocused, you know, and trying to help Martha with her anxiety. And, and, you know, and not only that, Timothy. Timothy had a, you know, Paul says to him, Timothy, God's not given you a spirit of fear or anxiety or worry or timidity, but instead he's given you a spirit of love, power, and of a sound mind. So he was trying to help Timothy through his anxiety. And do you know Paul had amazing anxiety? 
In fact, uh, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, he said, when, he, when I came to you, speaking to the Corinthians, he said, when I came to you, I came with fear and much trembling. Now, do you know the difference between trembling and much trembling? I'm going to show you. This is trembling, and this is much trembling. In other words, there's a major difference. But anyway, Paul was honest, and he said, I came to you in fear and much trembling. You know, and my words were not, you know, they weren't really well expressed. But I wanted your faith to be in God and not in me and not in the wisdom of men. And, you know, it's amazing. Also, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, and we'll put it up on the screen, Paul writes this when he's telling about all the difficult things he went through, where he was given 39 lashes by the Jews and 40 kills you, and that happened a few times. He was stoned to death and raised from the dead. And that wasn't on weed either. He was stoned to death with stones. And anyway, uh, the fact was he was raised from the dead. And then he says this, And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. And all the pastors said, (laughs) I'll tell you, being in the ministry is a lot of fun in many ways, but there's also a lot of anxiety. It it can really try to take you down. And and that's just being honest. Um, You know, uh, I just want to say Jesus gave us that first key of really getting our focus on him and focusing on the kingdom and not worrying about all these other things, which is easy to say. It's harder to do than say. Key number two, release anxiety in prayer and receive his peace. we got to be able to release that anxiety. Now, a person that doesn't know Jesus doesn't have a place to release the anxiety. They don't know God. They don't know Jesus. They live in that anxiety. We have the ability to do that. And the Apostle Paul, you know, the thing I love is he didn't write just, (laughs) the letters he wrote were not just theological treatises, although they were very strong theologically, but he wrote them out of the experience of his life. And so he struggled with anxiety. He writes this. He says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. And everything in the Greek, you know what it means, guys? It means everything. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah, you, you've taught them Greek. That's great. Anyway, <laughs> but he said, in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Now, here's the promise. So in other words, you've got to get those things and get them out of you and get them to God. And then he says, there's a promise that follows. And he said, if you do that, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. In other words, it goes beyond your mind or you're figuring it out. You know, and he says, it will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And that word guard is a military term. It actually means, uh, it means to encompass like an army around your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Is that good news or bad news? Now that's the promise. And uh, I guess the question that I want to ask is, what happens when that's not enough? You know, i got to tell you, in my own life... Uh, yeah, I, I struggled with anxiety when I had exams. And, you know, there were some things that happened when I, you know, just in my own life where I, I had some anxiety places. But a few years ago, I got overwhelmed by anxiety. My executive pastor was retiring, and I leaned on him for 10 years. He took care of all the details. Suddenly, I'm not a detail guy, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. You know, this is unbelievable. And then uh, not only that, uh, the church, we suffered a little bit. We lost some big givers. We lost a little bit in attendance. We just went through a a time, and I just started to really struggle. And I really struggled with anxiety. And i got to tell you, it was so strong. At times, it would just come in, and, and, and I didn't want to be in the ministry anymore. I just wanted to get out. I wanted to leave. I just, it was, I could feel the effect it had on my body. I work out, you know, intensely, and I could feel the effect it was starting to have on my body. And I thought, this isn't worth it. It's just not worth it. And uh, just, and then another incident happened, and, you know, something unfortunate happened. And, and uh, man, it just was, I just thought, I don't know if I can handle this. My wife was awesome during that time. Then my son uh, moved from Houston and and became our executive pastor, and then I knew I couldn't leave. Hey, I'm glad you're here. I'll see you. I'm out the door. I know I couldn't do that, so I had to hang in there. And i got to tell you, it was only by the grace of God and his strength, because I'd go to him, I'd say, God, I can't do this anymore. He'd say, you're going to have to hang in there. 
And uh, I felt like I was in the third period of a wrestling match and I was getting my butt kicked. And I didn't have any, I mean, and you just, you know, for those of you who wrestled, you just got to keep going and keep pressing and keep, even when you don't have anything in the tank. And that's exactly what I felt like. In fact, uh, uh, it only took me 20 years to write this book, but uh, the book Life in the Spirit I wrote. And by the way, this book isn't, I'm going to read this one passage because it relates to what I'm speaking on. And this book is really How to Live in the Spirit. Uh, I, I've taught many times at YWAM bases. Uh, in Denver, Colorado Springs, and all, all over the country, and also uh, in, in Australia. But, but anyway, the point is, and out of that, I put together, uh, basically, because I do the Holy Spirit Week there with YWAM, and uh, basically, it's, it's how to live, and just, you know, it's just a very honest and open book about how to live in the Spirit, and so uh, I just want to tell and by the way, my wife, I'm going to pray for a few people right at the end, and then I'll be out. Uh, I'll have these on sale. They're $16, $16 at Amazon, but for you guys, only $13. And if you can't afford $13, we'll, we'll do it for less. But probably can't do it for much less than 10 or I'll be losing money. I already am, anyway. Uh, anyway, it'll take the rest of my life to be able to... Anyway, that's not... Boring. <laughs> but here's what I want to say is, I just want to read this passage because uh, it's talking about the anxiety. And this book is not all about that. But, but I felt like it was important to put in the good things, you know, and... and, and it's a great thing. I had a lot of successes in my life. I played on an undefeated football team. Uh, we, were, we won the Middle Atlantic Conference uh, when I was a senior in high school. Uh, I was the captain of the wrestling team, went on. You know, and did, I had a lot of successes. Went to Grand Lake. I pastored there for six years. The church went from about 20 people. Uh, we, went to, we were running over 300 on the weekends in a town of 500. Uh, the, the, that, that's not the size. is not important. People were getting healed, delivered, uh, just saved every weekend. I mean, it was amazing, and even during the week. And uh, so, but here's what I found. Do you know that success can cover a multitude of dysfunction? Let me say that again. If you don't get anything else, success will often cover up a multitude of destruction, of, of, of <laughs> not destruction, a multitude of dysfunction. And I didn't, I grew up with some really weird dysfunction. And, you know, I'm sure many of you did too. And uh, it started to come back to haunt me. But anyway, let me just read this passage from my diary. Uh, and I just wrote in here, over the past two and a half years, I've had an intense battle with anxiety. I had minor bouts of anxiety in the past, but nothing like what I've experienced during the last few years. Let me share an excerpt from my journal, uh, written about, well, it was written about a year and a half ago from this, and this book was written, oh, about a little over a year ago. So, I can't get above this anxiety. It seems to tie me in knots, robbing my peace, my joy, my hope, and my ability to love. I keep seeing negative future consequences. Why? Is it because I'm getting older, losing my passion, or am I losing my mind? Sometimes it seems dark and depressing, like I'm in a dark pit and I can't climb out. But usually it is fear that seems to grip me during the day and in the middle of the night, robbing my sleep. I pray, quote scripture, rebuke the devil, pray in the spirit, exercise fervently. And it helps for a while, but nothing seems to permanently break this horrible anxiety. Oh, sometimes there's temporary relief comes, but soon it's back like an unwanted enemy. Help me, Lord. I'm sinking and hurting. You know, during that time, uh, my wife and the Holy Spirit, I want to just go live on the beach. I mean, I, I, this is, I'm not saying that. I've, I've lived on the beach before. In fact, I lived in a teepee when I was a hippie, had really long hair. Try to imagine me with any hair, let alone long hair. <laughs> anyway, uh, I thought, just live on the beach. I don't care. I, you know, I've had it. And uh, my wife and the Lord and the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, you know what? If you go to the beach, the, it'll be great for a week or two or three, but then that anxiety is going to come and you're going to say, what did I do? You idiot. <laughs> Why did you leave? And I'm so thankful now that I didn't. And by the way, I just want to say, uh, for those two and a half years, well, I'll get to that. It's part of the, part of the thing. So, so anyway, I just want to say that <laughs> what happens when that's not enough? Now, <laughs> my wife would say, you know, honey, you just need to rebuke this like... I can't remember whether she said Joyce Myers or Marilyn Hickey. I wasn't sure what, you know, who it was. But she said, you just need to rebuke it. And, uh, and I tried. But she's a thinker and I'm a feeler. If you've ever done the Myers-Briggs, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm way over on the spectrum over here on the feeler side. She's over on the thinker side. So for her, if something comes up like that, she just rebukes it. 
I thought, man, I wish I was like that, Ugh, but I'm not. Because for me, being a feeler, that, that anxiety, I would try. I would try to do it. I said, honey, I'm trying, but it's just... Uh. And she says, you're not trying hard enough. I go, I'm trying as hard as I can. And so, but for me, that feeling, the feeling would overcome the, the, the rational thought, you know, and, and I know Jesus could take care of it, but that feeling was so strong that it would take me down. And so for two and a half years, I counseled with a person uh, who did theophostic, and, uh, and, and it, it was amazing because this person was able to help me because I was able to go back into my childhood, and I thought my parents didn't love me. I was the oldest of three kids. My parents came out of depression. They were both working, and I was raised by nannies and babysitters, and I got sexually molested at four, and, you know, all these things happened, and I just thought they didn't love me. And so Jesus came and he reprogrammed my mind. They deeply loved me. They were just worried about finances, and so they were working all the time. So they weren't there for me like I needed them to be. And so that got shifted. A lot of things. Jesus would come and he would, and I realized for me, you know, rational counseling was okay, but that wasn't the kind of counseling that got to the root, the roots. I needed the roots taken out. And, and usually when you're dealing with emotional struggles, uh, there are roots that need to be uprooted. And God can do that. He wants to do it, but sometimes you got to do the work. And, uh, you know, I felt bad. I thought, man, I've been a successful pastor. And, you know, we ran, you know, at the heyday, we ran from between 1,800 and 2,000 on the weekends. And I thought, what is wrong with me? Why? What is wrong? And you know what? I felt like a failure. I remember telling my middle brother, I said, you know, I feel like a failure. He goes, how can you say you feel like a failure? You've led mom and dad and myself and my other brother to the Lord and you've done this and you've done that and you've done all this. I said, I don't care. I said, I feel like a failure. And see, when those feelings come in, it just robs you. It robs your ability to love. It robs your ability to, you don't have peace. You know, you don't have joy. You don't have the things that God wants you to have. The fruit of the Spirit gets, gets, it gets you know, it's like the vine gets squished by that anxiety. And so, man, I, I'll tell you, um, I got to tell you, when that's not enough, there are things you can do. And out of my own life, I want to share this because this is not just some little spiritual thing, you know. Just praise the Lord and everything will be fine. You know, maybe that works for you. And I do thank God for praising the Lord. I mean, that helps. But, but I got to tell you, sometimes that's not enough. And so the first thing that I want to say is be honest and get help. Say, get help. Get help. Don't be too proud to get help. You know, I think sometimes we feel bad as Christians. We shouldn't feel this way. We should be over this. We should have victory. But you know, sometimes, I've got to tell you, you've got to be honest. And you've got to say, you know what? I, I actually need help. I really do. And so, the good news is Paul. I love Paul because he's honest. And uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, he says, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were utterly burdened beyond our strength, that we despaired of life itself. In other words, he was depressed and anxiety-ridden. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves. You see, we oftentimes try to do it on our own power. And he says, but on God who raises the dead. Aren't you glad you serve a God who's powerful? Amen? <laughs> He's not a wimpy God. He delivered us from such a deadly peril, <clears throat> and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope, and he, that he will deliver us again. You also must help us by prayer. In other words, he was crying out for help, <clears throat> so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. He wasn't afraid to ask for prayer. He wasn't afraid to humble himself. He wasn't afraid to, to get that help. And I just want to tell you, Folks, we got to do that. We really need to go for that. And, and I had a lot of people praying for me. I had the church praying for me. I shared with the church. I said, man, I'm struggling, guys. You really need help. And this is when I was a lead pastor. And I said, I really need your help. I, 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 I'm really struggling. And I shared with my staff. I shared, obviously, with my son and his wife. And I, my, my wife was great. She, she put up with me during that time. And uh, I know Reese was going to give her a book today. Uh, what was the name of the book, Reese? <laughs> I'm teasing. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, the, the fact is she hung in there with me, and, you know, and, and I'm so grateful to her. Uh, our little dog hung in with me, too, and I'm grateful to her as well. Anyway, uh, I'll tell you, sometimes when you're struggling like that, you know, dog's man's best friend <laughs> next to your wife. Okay, anyway, um, 
Here's the other thing, and, and, and our daughter really helped me too. She helped me. <laughs> anyway, I don't know where I am here. But anyway, let me just say this. <laughs> There's some other things that help too. And here's some other things that help. We'll just put them up. And by the way, worship and the word, you know, that's kind of obvious. You guys know that. And that helps a lot. And uh, it would help. When I'd go into worship, the presence of God would come, and that would free me from those feelings. For, but it, would be, it wouldn't last. It would be there for a while. Uh, the word, I'd get into the word, and something would jump out, and it would really minister to me. But again, it wouldn't last. Exercise. I just want to tell you, exercise, really, I worked out every day because I couldn't go a day without exercising because if I did, I'd have anxiety. Because the, the, when you exercise, what it does is it creates endorphins, and so that would really help me. And I'd exercise, like, really, really hard uh, to, 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 to get those endorphins kicked in. Also, praying in tongues. i got to tell you, and there's a scripture. I didn't have time to look it up. It's, I think it's in Isaiah 28. It's the only time it really talks about tongues in the Old Testament. I think it's Isaiah 28, and it says when you, you know, through, I don't know, do you know what it says? <laughs> it says something about, I didn't have a chance to look it up. But anyway, it says something by stammering tongues that, you know, you get peace. And that's my paraphrase, probably a lousy paraphrase. But anyway, uh, the truth is that praying in tongues is powerful because when you pray in tongues, you are going beyond your mind. You know, it says in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, you know, verse 14, it says, when I pray in a tongue, verse four, verse 4, when I pray in a tongue, I edify myself. See, when I'm praying in tongues, the Holy Spirit's praying through my human spirit. And then it says in verse 14, chapter 14, verse 14, when I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, my mind is unfruitful. My mind is not involved. So it goes beyond my mind, which is driving me nutty. And so praying in tongues actually helped. But again, it would help for a period of time, but it, didn't, you know, it wouldn't always last for a long time. Also, another thing that helps are vacationing. Vacationing always helps. You can get away from the stress. You can get away from the stuff. But again, it's, you still come back to it. So, uh, and, and Xanax is helpful, too, if you're having a panic attack. Oh, Pastor, you shouldn't talk about drugs in church. Anyway, let me just tell you that sometimes I don't think it's good to get hooked on them. But you know what? Sometimes you need a boost to get you over the hump. So don't feel guilty if you have to pop a Xanax when you're having an anxiety attack. I know I did a few of those. Thank God I'm free now. I have no anxiety. It's amazing. I get flashbacks the way it was. It was horrible. Which gives me tremendous empathy for those who, you know, who struggle in that area. Um, And, you know, the other key is develop an attitude of gratitude. Sometimes it's really hard to have an attitude of gratitude when you're under (laughs) this cloud. But I got to tell you, you just somehow, I would recount, I'd go back and say, man, I'm so thankful for my wife. I'm so thankful for my kids. I'm thankful for my grandkids. I'm thankful for my dog. (laughs) I'm thankful, you know, just that I get to work out. I'm thankful. I mean, I I just go through stuff I was thankful for. And, uh, And, you know, Paul, after he talks about have no anxiety in anything but everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Notice he has that little phrase, with thanksgiving, make your request known to God. That's such a key phrase. <clears throat> that with thanksgiving, you know, you can pray, oh God, I'm really struggling. I can't believe this is happening to me. You know, <laughs> How many know that prayer is probably not going to get answered? Amen? It's probably not going to get beyond the roof if I just mumble. But if I can go, God, I'm so thankful that you're here. I can go to you. Yes, I'm struggling, but I come with thanksgiving. I thank you, Jesus, you've come into my life. I thank you, the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of me. I thank you that I'm not always going to be in this state of anxiety. You're going to take me through it. In Jesus, And so I begin to thank him, and, and that empowers you. So there's a difference in just grumbling and mumbling and complaining and at the same time bringing that anxiety and the struggles to him with thanksgiving. You know, it's interesting. Paul, after he says that, he goes into verse 8, and he says, Finally, brothers, and that obviously includes sisters, <laughs> whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Another version says, keep your mind on these things. In other words, that's where the focus is. Isaiah, I think it's 23.3 says, um, he will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. And that word perfect peace, it's the only time in the Bible where shalom appears twice right next to each other. It's basically, he will keep in him in shalom, shalom, whose mind has stayed on him. Do you want shalom, shalom? I sure do. So somehow we need to get, get press in and keep, keep our focus on him. Um, last thing I want to talk about, the final thing, is, 
And this is an important one. When you're in the midst of a struggle, and I'm going to just, not just anxiety, but maybe you're struggling, whatever the struggle might be, God is birthing ministry in you. Let me explain really clearly. When you are going through something, you suddenly are building an empathy for people who also are going through similar things. Basically, you have a love for them and a care for them. I used to stand up in the pulpit and say, I'll pray with you, but I'm not a counselor. I don't ever, you know, we have good counselors on staff, but I don't counsel. Well, the irony is now, <laughs> that's my major, <laughs> my major role now is counseling. I, I counsel many people. I've been able to help people with anxiety. I've been, I, I've been doing a lot of counseling, and I use the method that, I, that helped me. And, you know, I've never been trained in theophostic, and so I can't say I do theophostic, but I trust the Holy Spirit, and, and I have a care and a love for people, and it's amazing how Jesus will come in and encounter them, and I'm always amazed. They'll go, wow, I got so much help. And I go, Jesus is a lot better counselor than I am, isn't he? <laughs> you know, because it's amazing. And, and I got so much help from this. And so it, it changed everything. And people remind me, said, I remember when you used to get in pulp and you said, oh, I don't counsel. And that's what I primarily do now. And so, and I love it. I never thought I would. Before, I used to see the forest. Now I see the individual trees. My heart has always been to help people. And now I get to help people individually, which is awesome. I mean, I'm so thankful to God. I'm really grateful to him. Because, you know, <laughs> anyway, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting in that, in that study that I mentioned where a lot of people struggle with anxiety, like four, 40 million. Uh, it said the group that, that has increased the most in the last year are the baby boomers, of which I am one. And I think the baby boomers are going through transition now. Some are going in retirement. Some are, I mean, just different transitions that are happening. And so that, just that life transition causes... It causes anxiety. And the good news is God brings us through it. <laughs> you know, my, my youngest brother, he worked with the homeless for 25 years in, in New York City. And he went through a terrible time of anxiety. And he would say to me, he said, you're going to get through this. You're going you're to get through this. And I go, I don't feel like I'm ever going to get through this. He goes, you're going to get through it. Trust me. And thank God. It, it wasn't immediate. It was gradually. And, and now, <laughs> I just am so thankful. Because, boy, I have flashbacks to what it was like. And I'll tell you. It was really rough. Uh, but the final thing I just want to say is, and uh, God will use our difficulties to, for us to help others. And I really mean that. I want you to hear this. Because when you know that, when you're going through struggles, it'll help you to realize, wow, you know, God's bring, he's going to bring good out of this. According to Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called to calling for purpose. Well, this feels like, <laughs> like somebody said, when you're going through hell, keep going. Well, anyway, the truth is that's what it feels like. But good comes out of it because you're able to help others. In fact, Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of all comfort, who comforts us in all, all afflicting and all are afflicting, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In other words, as we receive that comfort, we're able to release that comfort to other people. Also, and he doesn't say this, I believe we build an empathy. When we see people that struggle, we care about those people, and we build an empathy. And how many of you know that love is so powerful? Love is the power, that powerful force you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I really mean that. That's really a very, very powerful statement because sometimes we'll try to wow people with our knowledge of the Bible or whatever, but the truth is sometimes if we'll just listen to a person and not be so quick to drop some little phrase, listen, listen to their heart, feel where they are, and then be very open and honest with them. It's like two beggars showing each other where to find bread. That's really what it boils down to. And so I want to pray for you today. And I, I just really appreciate being here. I appreciate the opportunity on Mental Health Day, which I didn't know. But anyway, uh, I'm very thankful. I love Reese and Sarah very much. And uh, I love this church just because I know you guys have the same heart they do. And so I want to pray for you tonight. 
And whatever you might be going through, it may not be anxiety. You may be going through something else. You may not be going through anything, which is great. But cheer up, you will be down the road, so it'll still help you, the prayer. <laughs> so what I want you to do is just put your hands out to the side like it's Christmas. I just want to pray for you tonight. And I just want to say this. If, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you've been away from him, before I pray, I just want to say his arms of love are reaching out. Maybe you felt bad because something difficult happened in your life. Maybe you feel like you're a failure, like I did, or you've let him down, or whatever it might be. Tonight, I want you to run back into his arms. And if that's you, and I got a sense on Wednesday night on a cold, yucky night, if you're here, you're, you're probably saved. But maybe you're not feeling real close to him tonight. So if you can be honest with heads bowed, if that's you, and say, man, I just want to run back into your arms, Jesus. I want you to just kind of wave at me, just, just, so you, just so I can acknowledge you. God bless you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, just put your hands out. I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I want you to say this to me. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for Jesus. Lord, I come to you now. I open my heart. Everything in me. Every struggle. I bring it to you. I release it to you. I let you come. Release peace. Release hope. Release strength. And most of all, release your love. That I might be a source of help to others. Whoever I meet, wherever I go, may I be sensitive to listen to the hearts I encounter. Jesus, I know you put me on this earth to bless others and to help others. So I look forward to those opportunities. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Well, bless you. Um, let me ask you this. Anybody here, would anybody, well, I don't want, no, I don't want to do that because then you feel weird. <laughs> so I was going to ask you if anybody needs prayer. But uh, we, you have prayer teams, right? Let's bring the prayer teams up. And I'm going to be here too, just for a little bit. My wife's going to head quickly. Uh, by the way, uh, as I said, this book, I'll come out, I'll be out in a few minutes and I'll sign your book if you'd like it. And uh, anyway, I love you. It was fun. Thank you so much.